Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Hu Man. I work on the Instagram camera team. Uh, we work on uh, AR effects and filters. Um, today, together with my colleague Annalisa, we're going to talk about some of the optimization work we do on our filters. So the target audience is uh, basically people, uh, the creative people, so artists, um, engineers, shader writers, um, generally people who are going to be using the Spark platform to make uh, AR effects or filters. So first, uh, we're going to, I'm going to talk about optimizing textures, and then my colleague Annalisa is going to talk about optimizing geometry, animations, and scenes. So first, why is it important that we optimize assets? So optimizing assets, by having a more optimal asset, your uh, effects will basically be more fluid. They will render faster. They will be more interactive. Uh, generally, it will provide a better user experience. Um, they will load faster, which means your users will, will be able to see your effects sooner or more likely to see it at all. Um, and overall, basically, it increases uh, users' engagement with your effect. Uh, when optimizing, it's important to consider the various uh, aspects of uh, your effect to optimize. So you might optimize for rendering performance, which will impact your users at hopefully 30 times per second, assuming your effect is uh, running at 30 frames per second on uh, most user devices. Or you, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you might want to optimize for loading time, uh, which is a one-time hit the very first time uh, a user will download your effect which is just as critical because that's the beginning of the funnel. And if it takes too long, then users will never even uh, see your effect. So first, let's talk about optimizing textures. Uh, one of the uh, best tools we have uh, on mobile devices are uh, GPU compressed textures. So GPU compressed textures are uh, very fast to load. Uh, they render very fast, and they consume a lot less memory. Uh, at runtime, so they basically have like best of all worlds, and uh, they tend to have very good quality for most types of textures. And in this example, you can see the uncompressed equivalent of this texture would have been about three megabytes, whereas the compressed version could be as low as two fifty six megabytes. Um, the other thing to remember is that uh, alpha channels on GPU compressed textures will either uh, increase the size of the files to double, like on Android platforms, or they will uh, consume some quality. So some of the precision is lost due to having to encode both color and alpha. So it's, if we can eliminate alpha channel, it's actually a huge win. So in this case, we're showing how we eliminate alpha channel in the, in the right image. So we just remap the textures in such a way that we'd never get outside of the relevant parts of the leaves. So we, were, we didn't even need the alpha at all. So that basically cut the texture size to half by going from RGBA to RGB. Another thing we can do is uh, using one bit alpha, which is most applicable to Android. Uh, this is useful when you have uh, pure on-off transparency. So you can just, there's no feathering or anti-aliasing on the edges. In that case, you can uh, use basically what's called ETC2 1-bit alpha. And uh, that is going to be the same size as, um, as just RGB. So it's as if you don't have alpha. Another thing you can do is uh, use different blending modes. So instead of using traditional alpha blending, you might use uh, additive blending or screen blending, in which case you don't really need an alpha channel. And this is one of the example effects at Instagram that uh, does that. Uh, it's very important to keep in mind size of texture. So one might think that uh, you know, for a pupil texture, you might need a really large, detailed uh, 1,024 by 1,024 texture. But if you think about it, if that pupil is never going to be any bigger than 100 by 100 on an average display device, there is no point making it any bigger than, say, 128 by 128. It's not going to add any more uh, visual fidelity. Another uh, tool to utilize is uh, texture transformation. So uh, by uh, rotating, scaling, uh, basically transforming textures in a variety of different ways, mirroring, 
you can create a lot of uh, variations reusing the same texture or a small set of, smaller set of textures as opposed to creating actual more textures. And this is an example from uh, Instagram Super Zoom where we try really hard to optimize it down so that it's as small as possible so that most users can uh, download the effect fast. Another thing to take advantage of are uh, material attributes. So with material attributes, you can use the same texture but add variation by changing the material. For example, here we are changing the uh, color. Our textures are just grayscale. We give it color with materials, which is also uh, a lot cheaper than um, creating more textures. Another technique we use is uh, texture atlasing. So with texture atlases, you can pack a lot of textures into fewer textures, which means you will have less draw calls, which is more efficient runtime. And you can also pack a bunch of small things into a large one in case you had like a lot of wasted space. So that makes your uh, textures more efficient as well. And this is showing the same technique used in the Valentine effect uh, for Instagram. Uh, texture trimming is also important uh, to be aware of. So when you have a case, like let's say you have a face texture, but you only care to modify the lipstick, for example, then there's no reason to have a, a texture that's a whole face, like 1,000 by 1,024, that you only care about the texture, the lipstick part of it. In this case, we use the separate smaller texture that we use UV transform, UV offset, um, and not only we got more precision around the lips, uh, we also use significantly less uh, data for doing so. Uh, one thing to keep in mind on UI textures is that uh, UI textures should not be GPU compressed because that part of the rendering doesn't go through the GPU rendering pipeline. And even if it did, a lot of uh, UI elements like text are kind of prone to artifacts with uh, many GPU compressed formats. And now Annalisa is going to talk about optimizing geometry. Thank you, Homan. So now we'll, we'll be covering geometry, which mostly will be affecting your file size, which, as you know, if you've been working a lot with Spark, you'll notice it's two megabytes, which is very re easy to run over, which is a problem we've had before. So tip number one is try and reduce your geometry as much as possible. Uh, in this example, I don't know if you're familiar with the sunglasses effect, but here we have five different sets of geometry for each of our five sets of uh, sunglasses that we have. And initially, we hadn't been checking on our megabyte count, and then we found out we were running on 2.4 megabytes, which obviously was not going to ship. Um, so then we had to go back and think of, well, what can we do to reduce this? So we went around and saw that we had too many edge loops on areas that were obviously flat and didn't need any extra detail. So we just went ahead and removed those. Also, another very important thing is that since we already knew the sunglasses are going to be on your face, uh, there's some faces in the inside that you were definitely never going to be seeing. So we made a point of removing all of those. And that helped us go down all the way to 1.4 megabytes. And then we were able to ship. So another thing to keep in mind is, for example, when we were building this effect, we already knew that there were some details that we were going to be repeating across our frame. So we made a point of exporting those as its own separate FBX. And then once we imported it into AR Studio, we just made a point of duplicating it to where it needed to go. But this way, we made sure that our file size kept fairly small and simple. Another way that you can add extra detail if you're not familiar with is normal maps, because uh, this way you can add some extra detail. It's very much used in the video game industry, and this way you can avoid adding a lot of geometry to your effects. So now on to animations. So animations will affect both your file size and they will also affect your frames per second. So this is very important to keep in mind. Uh, whenever you have very simple effects, such as the heart toast, uh, which is you know just a typical Instagram heart toast, um, this is only rotating in the Y axis. So we decided it's unnecessary to add rigging or skinning and also baking animation. And instead, we handled this procedurally. So this you can either do on the script or the patch editor, whichever is more comfortable for you. But this way, you can also avoid increasing your file size. Uh, when you're running into a lot of issues with File size for animations, there are several things you can keep in mind. One of them is try and replace sprite sheets whenever possible with something simpler, such as maybe, you know, 
doing a UV animation or scrolling. You can also do on the material, you can animate the opacity of your textures, and this way you can avoid adding additional textures to your scene. Also, try and keep your bone count as low as possible because the more bones you have, inevitably, the skinning is gonna be heavier and that way it's gonna take longer to load on your spark effect. Also, another thing is if you don't need this many animations, you can avoid baking some in um, because even if you're not using them in the final effect, let's say you have some three animations that you baked in, you're only using two, that extra one is still being counted. So you have to actually go ahead and delete it before you proceed. Let's see, so scenes are different in the sense that they don't add to your actual file size, but they will add to your rendering and calculations. So it's also important to keep in mind what you have in your scene in the part, as part of the hierarchy. So for the face tracker, it's very important to keep in mind that each face mesh is 1.2K uh, polygons, which is quite a bit, and especially since usually when people take selfies with a face filter like this, they will occupy more than 50% of the screen, which can lead to thousands and thousands of pixels rendering. And then you end up multiplying that by however many face meshes you have. So it's important to keep the lowest amount possible. One thing we had to learn the hard way at the camera art team was that you want to determine early on if your effect is gonna be for a two player or just a one player, because if you end up making this beautiful effect that has I don't know, some five or seven face meshes and then you wanna duplicate it, you can end up with something like 14, 15 face meshes and that's gonna significantly reduce your frame rate. So keep, just keep that in mind whenever you're building like makeup effects. And also, the high accuracy face tracker is better reserved for when you're actually gonna be having a lot of detail around the eye area or the mouth. Uh, if you're not gonna be doing a lot of like heavy-handed you know, makeup looks, it might be easier to just go with the standard accuracy face tracker since it's a lot more efficient. So for lighting, same as everything, keep the lowest amount possible, but for example, in terms of calculations, your ambient light is gonna be your cheapest light, then your directional light is a bit more expensive than the point light, and finally your spotlight is gonna be your more expensive light because it has a fall off. So, Whenever you're using these, just keep that in mind so you don't put too many spotlights in there. And if possible, if you have an object in your scene that you know for a fact is never gonna be moving around and your light is gonna be static, you can also bake this information into your texturing so that way you don't have to do these calculations at runtime. So for particle systems, what the key thing to keep in mind is just the density of the particles. You don't want to have thousands and thousands of particles rendering at the same time because that's gonna slow down your effect. So first of all, keep in mind the particle birth rate. Try and keep it low. Um, one thing you can do to interchange for density is instead of having one emitter, having 100 particles being born every other second, maybe you can use two emitters with different textures or an animated texture to add variety. Um, Another important thing is to keep in mind the particle lifespan because you don't want your particles you know, floating off into space and still calculating when they're not on your frame anymore. Same goes for um, the emission. If you already know your emitter for some reason is gonna be outside of the frame, let's say that on your front experience you have something happening and on your back experience you have something else, like you might wanna just turn it off just to avoid extra calculations that you don't need on your scene. So at the end of the day, like most of the things is just Try and keep the things that you're generally using in your effect and the things you're not using, try and remove them so that you can improve your overall performance. So profile first, optimize next, and try and find like what's the biggest thing that's causing you problems. Is it your file size? Is it how it's rendering? Um, because at the end of the day, all of this is gonna be a balancing act and you're gonna have to be very deliberate about saying, okay, this is gonna be the highlight of my effect. This is the most important thing. So that way you can give all the resources necessary to that one part, and then all the smaller details that don't require as many resources, just try and scale back. Because you don't wanna reduce your visual fidelity either. Um, well, thank you, that will be all for this presentation. We will be outside at the Instagram booth answering questions if you have any. Uh, but for now, happy optimizing. <laughs>